um, Katie Bell and Doug Booker as our speakers for today's Small Farms webinar presentation. Katie and Doug are both local food systems and small farms extension educators for the University of Illinois. Katie Bell serves Franklin, Jackson, Perry, Randolph, and Williamson counties in the southern part of the state. She has a background agriculture, agribusiness economics, market premiums for organic produce, and currently conducts research on specialty products, including asparagus, tomatoes, and peppers. Katie provides educational programming to specialty farmers, youth, and others involved in the local food system. Doug Booker is located in Decatur. He improves producer profitability and sustainability through demonstration and programming focused on using appropriate management strategies in all aspects of production. His work demonstrates practices in the areas of farm management, soil health, nutrient management, integrated pest management, and grazing. All right, so regenerative grazing is a livestock and land management system that helps improve soil health and, re and redu reduces farm production costs. We hope to learn the basics and maybe how it's being done here in Illinois. And I turn it over to you, uh, Katie. I think you, you go first. Yeah, uh, thanks for the introduction, James. I uh, hope everybody can hear me okay. Yes, we can. All right, uh, so we're gonna be giving you a broad basic overview of what regenerative grazing is and what it kind of looks like in our state and what some of our producers are doing locally right now. So when we talk about regenerative grazing, um, you may have heard other terms like adaptive, uh, adaptive grazing and adaptive grazing is kind of uh, interchangeable with regenerative grazing. So if I say adaptive grazing or regenerative grazing, um, I'm pretty much talking about uh, the same thing. Um, so we'll, today we'll be covering, like I said, a lot of the basics. What is it? Why you might use it on your farm? And then how you get started. So we will talk a little bit about some fencing systems, water, which is always a big, um, a big issue, how to get water into your different paddocks, and then some uh, different pasture systems that are being used in this um, adaptive grazing system. So whenever we talk about adaptive grazing, we just want to get, um, we may, start, whenever we hear grazing in general, we usually think about this system over here on the far left, this continuous grazing system. We see animals out in the pasture all season and they have access to the entire pasture and they're not being moved or separated from the rest of the pasture. So they're allowed to continually move through the pasture and there's no rest being given to the plants in that pasture. So the animals are just continually doing damage to the plants in that pasture. So we see a couple of things, uh, problems arise in this continuous grazing system. As I said before, um, you know, there's no rest being given to, to any of the plants in the area. The animals have access to the entire pasture. So they're grazing and then they're hanging out in their favorite spot. So if there's a particularly good um, stand of something that the animals really like, they're going to hit that harder than they will something that is a little less uh, palatable to them. Um, another thing that we see is our manure distribution is extremely stratified. So anywhere the animals like to be, whether that's a water source or a shade area, um, those are gonna attract the animals most frequently and that's where they're gonna hang out. So we're gonna see really uneven manure distribution, which in turn, if we're talking about soil health is gonna lead us to uneven nutrient distribution as well. So um, to improve upon this, people have, farmers have started to implement uh, a rotational grazing system. And this is what we typically think of whenever we talk about moving animals throughout the pasture. So as you can see in this middle photo here, our uh, large pasture has been subdivided into four paddocks. 
and the animals are moved on a very rigid, very fixed schedule. So maybe once a week we move the animals and we just rotate them around in this pattern. So this is better, but we are still seeing some issues with manure distribution because again, we've got a central water source that the animals are coming to, maybe a shelter where they're um, spending a lot of time and therefore leaving a lot of manure in a certain uh, location. Um, one of the issues that we see in a typical rotational grazing setup is, is that the animals are still have a fairly large paddock area that they're being allowed to graze and they're spending quite a bit of time here. So again, they're finding their favorite plants and they're really um, you know, doing quite a bit more damage to the plants than just grazing through at one time. Um, another thing that we can see develop here is, is that whenever you move in a very predictable pattern, so in the spring, we start in this pasture and then we move to this pasture and so on. And if we start that way each year, we can start to see um, seasonal weed problems develop as well because the animals are always in this pasture in midsummer, let's say. So we're, we're seeing some issues there. So whenever we talk about regenerative or adaptive grazing, what we're really talking about is a very uh, more complex system um, and we're being a lot more flexible. So the animals are being moved at least once a day, um, depending on your goal, sometimes more like two or three times a day. And you're moving them in different paddock arrangements. So you can, you can graze them. Um, we'll talk about stock densities in a little while, but you are adjusting um, the, the paddock sizes that they're in using a temporary fencing system. And then we're also supplying them water as well. So they're not spending very much time in each area before they move on to the next one. And um, this allows for a lot longer rest period for other paddocks, which allows the plants to regrow. And they're also not being um, continually fed on either. And so here we're seeing a lot more even manure distribution because the animals aren't spending a lot of time in each paddock area and also the next time that we rotate through, we'll graze this in a different patter, pattern or a different order. So if we strip grazed it this way, um, this time in these strips, we may do it in blocks the next time. So it's a much more um, active moving system than what we see with some of our other more traditional grazing uh, systems in the past. So regenerative grazing is a tool that we can use to address multiple goals. So we are using grazing um, and this type of grazing to um, address multiple goals because one thing that, that people, whenever you hear that we're moving fence and building new temporary fence every day, you know, that can be a little bit intimidating, but we're also accomplishing multiple goals at the same time. So we're feeding our livestock, um, we're already distributing manure. So if they're out spreading it evenly within the pasture, then we don't have to go back through and um, maybe move manure into from a feedlot and then spread it onto our fields. And we're also improving soil health by allowing plants to have a chance to, to regrow and leaving really healthy, active and alive um, root systems in the soil. We're improving our soil health and our soil biology. So, we have a plan with regenerative grazing, but we're also adaptive. So you wanna make sure that you're keeping good records so that you um, aren't always starting in the same place on accident. Or if we know that we have a problem area that we would like to get covered, if we can make notes of that, then that will really help us in our ultimate goal of you know, trying to have a really healthy soil and a really healthy system. So you can alternate uh, your grazing periods. You may want to, um, give a pasture more rest if you see that it's been hit particularly hard, or if you had an incident where you couldn't move the animals and they had to stay there, um, you know, you may want to allow it for, for more rest. Again, moving in different patterns allows you to uh, control weed problems or to prevent weed problems from arising, depending on uh, seasonal patterns. And then again, I had talked a little bit about changing stock density. So when we talk about stock density, that's measured in pound, livestock pounds per acre. So um, if you wanna have a really um, high stock density, you would put the, you could, and you only have a few animals, if you only have a few animals, you can put them 
in a much smaller paddock, which increases their um, amount of, of pounds per acre on that particular area, which you can use for a couple of different reasons. Um, one can be that if you're trying to cause a, a trampling effect through the field, if you're trying to, to knock down a cover crop, or if you're working in a particular problem spot, um, you, can, you can adjust your stock density. So again, it's a variable system because we're trying to rebuild our, our soil health and our soil biology. Um, we are being adaptive working with things like weather. So if you have um, heavy rain events and you, you do have to maybe have a place to hold uh, the animals for a few days so that we're not um, doing a lot of damage to our soil structure, you know, we may need to do that. Um, so always having a backup plan is gonna be important. Or if you have a, a, a place where you weren't able to get a cover crop down, then maybe you can graze that instead. Um, so again, we're dealing with things like seasonality, uh, family issues or emergencies that might arise. You know, This allows you to work around some of those things as well, because with this system, this is not something that you have to do uh, 365 days out of the year. You may only graze for a few months in this spring and summer. Um, it's, so it's a really nice system to be able to fit in and make it your own. Um, and then even dealing with pasture differences across your entire farm, we just wanna make sure that we can be variable and flexible. So like I had said before, this is a really observation-based uh, system. So we're gauging our pasture rest periods, looking at how much uh, forage we still have on top of the ground, judging our animal health, and looking at the amount of leaf matter left. And again, this is something that you can do while you're rebuilding, while you're building a new temporary fence and moving the animals, you can really start to see, um, uh, your, you can really accomplish multiple goals at the same time. So whenever we talk about um, doing damage to the plants and leaving uh, enough behind that we aren't, uh, damaging it, one thing that we look at with rotational grazing or um, in, in some of our more traditional rotational grazing systems or even um, where they are staying in the same place the whole time, you know, we can see a lot more damage and the damage that we do to the top of the plants also affects the roots. So we want to try with adaptive grazing to leave 50% or more of plant material above ground because once we start to get, um, so 50% of the plant removed only causes about two to 4% uh, percent slow or stopping of root growth underground. But at just 10% more, we're doing almost 50% damage to the roots. So we're really um, knocking our roots back. So if we wanna keep our, especially our perennial pastures alive and going, um, we want to make sure that we aren't overgrazing our pastures. So as I had said before, um, you know, regenerative or adaptive grazing, we're using observations to make our decisions. Um, it is more frequent moves than a traditional rotational pattern, but it's, um, it can be very doable. And we'll have um, a couple of interviews that we did with, with farmers that are doing this right now. And they talk about um, that, that it's a lot easier than, than you might think um, starting out. And we're using animals as a tool to promote soil health. So we're actually using the animals and getting them to do some of the work for us. They're spreading manure um, and, and then putting nutrients into the soil and they're controlling um, our plant heights so we don't have to go through and mow. And they're really stimulating the soil. Um, and we're focusing a big part of regenerative grazing is focusing on providing adequate rest to the pastures between the grazing periods. So we want to make sure that we are allowing the plants to regrow enough in between grazing that we're not doing significant root damage underneath. And because it's an adaptive system, we want to make sure that we have a backup plan. And one thing that we want to think about is having a shed or a lot to hold animals over either in the winter time if we're grazing or if we're keeping livestock on farm all year round or um, during large rain events where we just aren't able to get them out into the pasture. And um, so in this picture on the left, we have a, a holding shed um, and, and round bales of hay. On, um, 
Ted Kroskoff's farm um, here and so that they can use this facility to hold animals in particularly rainy areas or rainy days, or if we have um, any vet work that might, be, might need to be done, it's good to have some sort of lot or holding facility that's a little bit of a sacrifice area um, that we kind of allow the animals to tear up so that we can protect the rest of our fields if we need to. And on the right, we have um, a large chicken tractor. Um, and this has been parked for the winter time. So as you can see, the animals are, are the chickens are doing um, quite a bit of work on the soil here. And in the summers, they move this throughout their fields and um, allow the birds to, to get bugs and um, things from the pasture. But this has been parked for the winter time. And this also provides a good um, safe area for, for the chickens uh, at night from predators. So just again, to really illustrate um, this concept of leaving enough roots and take half, leave half. So we wanna take about 50%, but then leave 50% to allow the plant to regrow and survive, especially if we're putting a lot of work into establishing uh, perennial pastures. So we've talked about what it is, but why would you wanna do it on your farm? Why might regenerative grazing be right for you? So it's again, a really good tool to improve soil function. We're setting up um, a much more uh, you know, natural system. We have animals coming through and grazing on pasture land, or you can also use this in um, no-till systems and, and allow animals to come through and graze, uh, a, graze or trample a cover crop down or to come through after a cash crop has been planted as well. Um, it allows, it's a system that really allows for better water holding capacity and reduces runoff. Um, so they see just within a few years of doing this and incorporating this with a no-till system that it can really uh, allow them to get started and get into the field a lot earlier than some of their neighbors that are doing conventional tillage. We really see a reduce in input cost because again, the animals are putting uh, nutrients back into the field um, in, in the uh, cases of manure. And then also some uh, herbicide uh, that might be of use to terminate a cover crop, we can see uh, some reductions in that as well because allowing the animals to come through and really trample down a cover crop before you go in and plant a cash crop is an option in some cases. Um, we're seeing a lot better forage nutrient quality. So our grass, our grasses have a lot higher uh, nutrient quality in this system. The animals are healthier, they're happier uh, because they're out in the open and allowed to graze and move around. They're not being held um, in, a, in a smaller uh, feedlot type situation. You can really make use of less profitable areas. So maybe highly erodible lands, um, wooded areas that, that you're not doing a lot else with or um, areas in that flood quite frequently, grazing may be an option in, in those systems. And um, it can really help you diversify your operation. So if you can graze a few animals, uh, whether it's cattle or small ruminants like sheep and goats, um, or even running chickens. Um, so it can really add another layer to your um, already existing operation. And another reason that the growers are really interested in this system is, is it's, um, Another step towards being good stewards to the land um, with improving soil health, uh, reducing erosion and runoff, you know, this can be um, another really important uh, reason um, to, to use a system. And so I'm going to hopefully play a video for you here. Uh, this is Jill uh, Vonderhaar, and we just talked to her a little bit. She's at Main Street Pastures in uh, St. Rose, Illinois, talking about why they got started with the regenerative grazing. Why did you and Chad go into regenerative grazing instead of just uh, having a feedlot? A um, couple of reasons. My husband is, is a big proponent of cover crops and, and just and keeping the soil healthy and all that. And then we were growing, we just had a few animals in the back selling quarters and halves of beef, you know. And when I couldn't sell a quarter or a half a beef, 
and we it was fat, I had to send it to the market. And they don't care how it was raised. I, we lost money on animals, I'm, I'm being completely honest, and it was very frustrating because we knew we had a good product. You know, we knew we were raising it um, outside and, you know, getting inputting good inputs and, and we don't do any hormones and, and all that. So it's very disappointing when you have to bring an extra animal to the feedlot and, and you don't get, yeah, you barely break even on it or lose money on it. So anyway, the people, the customers that we had that were getting quarters and halves, some of them would say, well, that's just too much. I can't handle that. So that was the next step. Okay. So then I got my uh, meat broker's license and I could handle it by the package. And so, yeah, just kind of evolved from there. And so we started just doing a little marketing breeze. Um, every other week was that was the first year and uh just did beef and pork you know and then we had been raising chickens on our uh, on the side with some and butchered them with family and friends and it was like oh i can't eat chicken from the store anymore this is really good you know <laughs> they were outside they were on the grass and the pastures and all that and yeah so it, it's grown from there now the chicken's a little more tricky because they either have to go up to arthur is our closest usda processor I do have a license to process them on farm, um, but that limits me. I can't sell to restaurants that way. I can't sell to wholesale accounts that way. Right. So there's some limitations with that, but it does give me some uh, options, you know. So when I when I take them up to Arthur, I want a large batch. I can't drive 50 birds up there. It doesn't make sense. And so we scaled up. Actually, in our new pen, what we call the, the prairie schooner, I'll raise 400 at a time. So then I can, that justifies the whole day to the, to and from the processor. Yeah. But if we might do some smaller pens in between, we'll do those ourselves. Or if I have some that either they're fat ready before the date I had booked up there or after, then we can, you know, you can try to get a better ideal size of a bird instead of just stuck with the processing date, which happened quite a bit last year yes. with all the, the delays in processing. It was tough. You know, even, even, I mean, still even seeing it now, it's, I had some pigs that were over, over fat, but I can't get them in any faster. And so well, they just have a little extra fat and it, the, the cuts are fine, but you fed that animal oh, an extra couple months and you didn't need to, you know? Right. So they're just trimming more fat off of it, but it makes and, more and lard. What, and, <laughs> so, yeah. and, and how long have you been doing this? Oh, we've been doing cover crops for a long time. Um, probably. 10 years or so um but i'd say i've been selling meat by the packages this is my fourth year at farmers markets so prior to that you know it was just kind of a, a stepping you know a little bit more and more all the time so obviously we last year we we um increased our turkeys we did about 50 or 60 turkeys last year um that was a why did so um you know, as Jill talked about, she started, they just started doing um, cover crops with their, um, into their conventional uh, system and their no-till system and they added cover crops. So she really talks about, you know, starting small and then adding on to it and building on. So um, this is just a really good graphic talking about um, a couple of different things. So one thing to note here is that as we add, um, more diverse planting. So we incorporate uh, cover crops into our cash crop and then using a, a no-till system, um, we're improving uh, soil health. And then whenever we allow um, animals into that system, you can see as we, um, we're expanding our top layer of soil here, we're really increasing our soil uh, biology and um, our organisms under the soil. You know, they're seeing a lot more earthworm activity as they um, add on to the system. And all of these um, things also allow for us to have a much uh, better water holding capacity so that we're not losing water to, to runoff and erosion. And then um, we're also not seeing, you know, as much standing water either. So this is from uh, Ted Kroskoff's farm. This is a picture of a silvo pasture area or a wooded pasture area. Um, and this is a really good example of what we might do, um, a way that we might use areas that we otherwise wouldn't be able to use. Because this is 
in a low-lying area. It's next to a creek that he said floods um, a couple of times a year. So even if he were to clear this area of trees and say to plant a cash crop, um, he would most likely see a lot of losses to, to flooding and then also you know quite a bit of erosion. So in this way, he can make use of this, um, this area here. And this is what it looks like. So this was, this picture on the left was taken in February, beginning of February. And then this is taken in the middle of summer whenever he's grazing cattle. So as you can see, just how lush and green um, this area is. And then it's actually being productive where in another type of system, it may not be nearly as productive. Um, so now I'm just gonna turn it over to Doug and he's gonna talk about how we're actually going to get started grazing. Thanks, Katie. So getting started in grazing, uh, we're going to have to uh, think about fencing. So we have a lot of portable options, temporary options available to us. We have the poly wire, the po poly tapes, the electric netting, step in posts, there's uh, varieties of uh, other uh, different fiberglass posts. We have fencing reels, which are nice for wrapping up the poly wire and, uh, and poly tape so that we can quickly reel it in or reel it out, uh, which is very helpful. And then we need a good fence charger and perimeter fence so that we can keep animals in and predators out. Uh, Katie talked a little bit about shade for shelter. We need shade for shelter. We also need it uh, in the case of chickens, it's very important at night for predator protection to help keep those animals where they're supposed to uh, in safe water. This is here when we get into our regenerative, uh, this adaptive grazing system, we, that water needs to be able to move. Now, it's great if you've got uh, uh, in, uh, in the in-ground uh, water system across your pasture areas, but more than likely when you start out, you're gonna be using some type of a portable system. And we have to make sure that, that our water keeps up as we move those paddocks every day or several times a day. So that's what we, we more or less need there. Next slide. So here's some examples. Over on the left, uh, you can see uh, a small uh, portable system that uh, Jill and Chad Vanderhauer use on their farm for feeding and for water. Uh, this, they also have a similar system on running gear that they use with their cattle so that they can have water out in those pasture areas as they move the cattle every day. Uh, and it's also easy for them to get access to, particularly with their larger system because it's on, on a wagon running gear so they can bring it back to the home place where they have access to water, fill it up and then take it back so the animals have water. Up there in the upper right, that's the, as Jill says, the prairie schooner, their chicken tractor. And, um, and that's kind of a Cadillac system that they grew into. But in the lower right is what they started out with. And that was just simple uh, animal panels, uh, bet in a hoop shape attached to a wooden frame uh, that they could cover or uncover for shade that they could then pull the chickens across the pasture in, I mean, move the chickens in across the pasture every day. And so uh, it worked well for them, for, uh, for Jill, for, about, for four years. And now that they've, they've grown, they've moved into that larger system. Next slide, please. So here is a nice uh, clip with Jill talking about predator control. So you, you have your chickens out and things. What do you do for predator control? Um, um, the dogs. Yeah, you yeah. heard, you, you saw them barking when they mm -hmm. got here. Um, we used to have issues with fox, possum, skunk, uh, minx was my last straw. Mm -hmm. um, two spring, I guess it was two years ago, you know, my chicken, coop had two by four wire and then suckers got inside of there. I mean, they're just that small and it's devastating. I mean, they'll get 20 hens in one, one full swoop. Um, so as we talked to other 
people like what do, what do I need to do? And I said, well, you need you need uh, great Pyrenees. There's other there's other breeds. Um, the ones I have are a Pyrenees. They have some Commodore and um, Anatolian Shepherd in them as well. Mm-hmm. But they're they're just two, so it's a process being puppies. You know they're big, and um, but they're doing well. And I haven't I had one falcon last year. Um, I was running a group of pullets through our orchard, and I started letting them out during the day. I had one falcon get a pullet, but other than that, in the last two years, I haven't had any predator issues. So you. you- so, here. Here, here we can see some of our different fencing and fencing materials that we, we can use. Uh, over on the left, uh, that uh, uh, shows all the various reels that Ted Crosscoff has. Of course, Ted's been doing this now since 2008. So uh, as he said, uh, he, he may have a few more reels than he really needs anymore. But his, he says, when you have them, you use them. Uh, he has step in posts. Those are up there on top, which are quick and easy to put in the ground. Um, over in the top right, that's the electric netting. Uh, very good to use for temporary fencing when we have smaller animals like chickens or we're dealing with uh, sheep or and possibly uh, with hogs, pigs as well. And then down in the lower right, we've got a, the, a perimeter fence. And this is a picture from Ted Kroskoff. Uh, this is a five wire high tensile fence. Uh, if you look closely, you'll see that three of those five wires are electrified and, we're, and two are not. And so once again, this idea is, is that we want to make sure that we keep animal, our animals in and other predators out. And so this idea of having uh, grounded wires with electrified wires really helps to make sure we get that shocking experience if they're trying to come through the fence. So, uh, but once again, uh, and it also allows you to use your temporary fencing off of those electrified wires. So you have that electric electrified fencing anywhere on the farm as long as you can contact it back up to the perimeter fence. Next slide, please. So fencing systems. Here's Ted Kroskoff talking about his system. Oops. In the picture. Sorry about that. My mouse is frozen. (laughs) There we go. <laughs> these these fences and, and this system grazing this way, it's not a difficult system to manage. Um, I spend about 30 minutes a day moving the portable fencing and putting up the next day's fence and checking on the cattle. And I can tell the cattle condition uh, while I'm moving fence by how they move into the fresh uh, forage. If anybody's got a foot problem or anybody's got anything going on, that's when I see it. And uh, so I I just feel like that's the best way for me to handle the grazing. You can see how fast it rolls up. I don't, I'm not cranking my grains up. Uh, people have picked up paddocks in mine. They've set them up with a battery powered drill and uh, you don't have to crank it. but. I can crank my fence in less than a minute, and that way I don't have to worry about the drill. Oh, I, I see your step. So you have step in posts. All Those the are way. all step in stakes, yeah. Oh, okay. On the corners, we usually do a T post just because it needs a little more strength. But yeah, everything else is step in stakes. I mean, my kids have gotten really good at putting up fence, you know. I mean, you you get your setup going. We have the reels where you unreel them. Um, so you have somebody walking along, putting the stakes in, and the next one hooking the fence up. So. It really doesn't take that much time to, to put it up and, and move it and all that. So, okay. yeah. But they also said you really need a bigger charger uh, while you're at it. And so now I'm up to 22 joules. And that way I don't have to worry. Uh, it, the fence doesn't have to be completely clear. It's going to have a charge on it all the time, no matter. And a lot of the time I run the charger on half power because uh, I don't need the voltage, you know, but 
these cattle are gentle. They're I, I really got to give cattle credit, but uh, it's important to have a powerful enough charger so that you don't have to spend all your spare time weed eating the fence lines and stuff. Yeah. And I don't. I, I don't. These are these are thirty percent wood and sixty percent not wood or seventy percent. They uh, they come from Power Flex fence out of Missouri. And they'll lay over like that and just come back. And so the deer hit it. I've seen the deer hit the fence and roll, and the fence is fine. You must be giving them fiberglass. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because fiberglass, it, they would break. Mm -hmm. How do these, just generally, how do these compare like to the cost of like the fiberglass step-ins? Um, right now, these, these particular posts, I don't think are available but they make a similar one and another company makes one. And I think they're not much different in price than the fiberglass. Okay. And how long have these been out here? Yeah. Well, 2008 or nine. Oh, wow. So as you can see, we have lots of options for our fencing and you need to kind of keep that in mind and, and Find a system that works for you and go out and, and talk with people and see what works and what doesn't work. Now, as we have pasture systems, and Katie mentioned a lot of this already, annual pastures, where we may just be uh, seeding something like uh, a sorghum Sudan grass. Uh, it could be a pasture that follows after wheat harvest. Uh, we can have our perennial pastures that we typically think of when we think of a pasture. We can be grazing cover crops. We can be grazing cover crops after the harvest of a cash crop. We can just turn animals in after a cash crop as well. And then as Katie, Katie brought up and uh, before, uh, we can use this for silvo pasturing, you know, grazing in wooded areas. We can also do it in other places. Uh, somebody's talking. There we go. Uh, to uh, that, where we have uh, high uh, erosion possibilities, and it really needs to be kept in perennial cover uh, and shouldn't be in row crop production. We can then be gaining a profit from areas that otherwise wouldn't be uh, producing any income on the farm. And so grazing can work in quite well in these areas. Um, next slide, please. So what we have to do this as it is, the you know, regenerative grazing is an adaptive management grazing system. And so it's, we're gonna have to adjust timing, frequency, duration, and intensity. So timing, the time of the year that the animals go out there, do you, will you need to pull animals in out of an area if we are in a prolonged wet period and we don't want them out there uh, tearing up the sod in a permanent pasture or causing undue soil compaction out there? Another issue is, is if we've got um, river bottom or creek bottom land, uh, of course, uh, there's only going to be possibly certain times of the year where that those pasture areas will even be available for grazing. Frequency of grazing. This is going to depend once again on uh, the stage of our forage, how fast it's growing. Uh, in the spring of the year when the forage is growing fast in, in uh, here in central Illinois in May and early June, we may be moving those animals two or three times through paddocks, the different grazing paddocks, because we're going to have, we're going to want to try to keep it in a vegetative state as long as possible. So we'll be turning those animals out there and, you know, they're going to be eating the blooms and the flowers uh, and the pre-seed heads so that we can keep it from getting stemmy as long as possible. What's our duration? Well, our duration, um, is going to depend on weather. It's going to depend on the time of the year. And once again, this is where we're out there every day 
checking on our animals and checking on our forage to see when we need to be moving those uh, fences, when we need to be moving those animals. Uh, Katie mentioned about foot trample uh, intensity, uh, getting those pounds per acre. Um, if we have something and it's gonna happen, we're gonna have parts of the pasture uh, that get mature before we're able to get those animals in there. They're going to have seed heads and it may begin to get very stemmy. Uh, we can use that to our advantage instead of pull, bringing out a bush hog or a brush cutter on the back of a tractor to mow it all down uh, to get back to green material. We can put our livestock out there, raise the number of pounds per acre so the animals are crowded in there tighter half million pounds or so possibly and with the idea is they're going to go in they're going to eat the seed uh, they're going to find what palatable materials are out there but they're going to use those nice sharp hooves that they have to trample that down and incorporate that into the top uh, inch or so of the topsoil, which is going to speed the breakdown of that lignin and cellulose material and all that brown stemmy material that may be out there. So we can use that to our benefit. We can also use that for benefit if we have a problem spot or where we notice possibly invasive uh, shrubs or trees coming in or, or weeds, uh, we can handle it before it becomes a big problem and we can use the livestock to do that. Next slide, please. So once again, coming back to this slide again, this is a process. Uh, continuous grazing, has its issues, and it does, it truly has its issues. We tend to overgraze parts of the pasture, undergraze, poor manure distribution. Rotational grazing, um, it improves that, uh, it, it improves that. We do better, we do better with that. Uh, we get better utilization of our forage, uh, better distribution of the manure, but we still have the issue of having uh, water that the animals have to come back and forth to in fixed locations in those uh, paddocks that we rotate through. So then our, our next step and, and, and really the, the model for not only improved animal nutrition, but also for improved soil health is our adaptive grazing or regenerative grazing where the pasture spends most of its time resting and growing, and the animals come in on this fresh, fresh luscious vegetation, and they're, they're eating the best of the best day after day. While they're doing that as well, they're distributing manure more uniformly across the pasture, which is adding nutrients quickly to the soil and it's providing material for rapid digestion by our soil micro life and macro life. Next slide, please. So here's a picture um, once on the left. That's what Ted's pasture looked like uh, three weeks ago. <laughs> on the right is how it looks in the summertime. And as you can see, those animals have plenty of forage that they're eating and they certainly don't look like they're, they're starving at all. But I'd also like you to take note on the left side, there's a lot of forage still out there. And I asked Ted about that because there was eight inches of, uh, uh, of grass that it, he left to allow rest from the fall on. And I ask him, uh, you know, usually, I mean, typically people kind of take it down to, you know, four inches, you know, going into the fall. And he goes, if I take it down to four inches, then I lose two weeks of grazing in the spring. And he said, the longer I leave it in the fall, the quicker I get to graze it in the spring. And he said, hay is the biggest cost we have. He said, so I want to get out there in the spring as soon as I can. And so we need to kind of remember that, that in the fall of the year, we, there are some things we can do that makes this system really work well all year long and makes it very profitable. Next slide, please. 
So your next steps, you know, consider what you want to do. Come into it slowly. Uh, check out all your different rotational options, work into it. This is a great way to bring a new generation onto the farm if we have a multi-generational farming uh, unit. It's a great way to bring another profit producing enterprise onto the farm. Uh, you wanna start small, learn, and then grow as you get more confident and more proficient in your grazing skills. And Jill mentioned that in one of our video clips. And next slide, please. And we're gonna have Jill talk a little bit about that. Oops. Did your mouse lock again? Yes. Oh. Yeah, yep, there we go. <laughs> free, free educational thing you can find. I mean, I've done the small farms webinars. Um, our seed, I was talking about our seed guy, Cliff Shetty, has um, been on pasture walks, been on, um, there's all kinds of resources. Anything you can find usually through the NFCS office or soil and water, I mean, same place, but you know, they'll have farm days or they'll, they'll bring in speakers and never be afraid to ask questions. And you get to one and you might feel overwhelmed, but bring home a little, little, just little pieces. Cause I, you can't decide tomorrow that you're going to do all this stuff, but if you slowly grow into it, let's start with cover crops and then, okay, well then I can put some animals on there, you know, and it, it you've got to kind of, you, it's a, it's a process and I, I'm not perfect, nor are we, you know, we're not even close, but every year we make another step closer to ideal, you know, very, <laughs> It's awesome to be able to talk to other uh, poultry producers in the United States that do it the way I do because there's my neighbors aren't doing it. You know, there's right. not a whole lot in the area. I know just a, of a few guys that are an hour or so away that we talk and, and share tips and, and all that. But you reach out and, and always be willing to learn. Yeah, that's that's been really helpful for us. Very cool. Well, every free education. <laughs> so, uh, we'd like to thank uh, Ted Crosskoff uh, from Hickory Flat Cattle Company in Highland, Illinois, uh, Jill Vonderhauer, and her husband, Chad, uh, Main Street Pastures uh, near St. Rose. They have a Breeze mailing address. The Pasture Project, uh, they do gr they've been doing some great regenerative grazing field days and the Land Connection. Um, and next slide, please. Oh. So before I talk, ask for questions, I want to show this picture here that's kind of in the spotlight. Uh, that's a picture of Ted's cattle grazing in the summer. But if you'll notice, they're in only a small por portion of that large paddock area. And so once again, and you can also notice how that this paddock is in bloom. Lots of the lots of the plants uh, in that diverse planting are in bloom, but yet in the distance they aren't. And so he's using the the cattle once again to come in here and keep his paddock, this particular paddock, in a nice vegetative state longer through the season. So um, we'd also like you to do our evaluation if you got a smartphone, you can uh, put it up there and that'll take you to our evaluation. And now any questions for Katie and I. Thank you so much, Doug and Katie. And yes, there's quite a number of questions <laughs> in the chat box. And the very first question, I hope you can understand it, was how do we apply the 50% rule in reverse to eliminate poison ivy? Uh, well, th this is where we we talk about uh, uh, increasing. Now, now it's going to depend if the poison ivy has completely taken over a section of the pasture, uh, then that area may need to be renovated. But if there's only just some poison ivy showing up in parts of the pasture, this is where you might want, this is where the idea of, of increasing the intensity, getting that trample effect in there. 
so that the animals are actually damaging that plant and uh, eating and destroying it, and which is what we're looking for. So it can be done, but it depends on the level of infestation. Uh, if, we're, if we have a high infest, infestation in an area, then we may be needing to look at uh, doing some kind of rehabilitation of that area. Thank you, Doug. If, if that's not satisfactory, T. Capram, you can add another question in the chat box following this. And then Sarah was asking, can you tell us again Jill's farm, who was featured. Is there more to that interview that we can watch? Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. We, we have more, but we only had a certain amount of time. Okay. All right. Uh, another question. What animals are best for regenerative grazing on a farm that doesn't plan to sell meat products? I guess it's coming from somebody who does specialty crops. And I would say you're, you need to look at the purpose. What is your purpose for having the animals there? And are you wanting to have any products to sell from them, such as dairy goats or uh, specialty sheep with wool that's attractive to spinners? Um, there are those kinds of options as well. And maybe from a food safety point of view, <laughs> yeah, you probably want to graze after you've harvested what you want to harvest and the animals can have the rest of what is remaining. So between seasons. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. We, we, we need that 120 days on fresh manure, right? James? That's correct. That's correct. That's correct. <laughs> and then there's another interesting question here from Nicholas. How do you seed a really tight tree field area with cover crop seed like we like the one we just saw? Can't use very big equipment. I think that's the picture that Katie showed. Oh, 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 with that 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 big uh, chicken tractor. Mm. Oh. No. I think he means the, the silver pasture right. with, oh. the, with the trees. Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. So uh, Ted told us that that um, is just what came up. So he cleaned that area up and then that's over a few years of, of allowing the animals to be there and what was already the kind of the dormant seed bank um, that came in. And so um, I would think if you were wanting to seed a, a crop into an area like that, you could probably do some, you know, in a, in a fairly small area, some broadcast seeding with some of your smaller, um, you know, like backpack type uh, spreaders or, or things like that. Um, but all, all of the, the forage that was in that picture, he said, just came from what was already in the seed bank. Um, I don't know if Doug has anything he wants to add to that. And, and, and also, he has, you know, Ted has a silvo pasture, so, you know, light is hitting the ground. Um, his, his cattle aren't in a forest where there's no light hitting the ground because of the intense tree canopy. And so this is, this is a, a, a management decision that Ted made so that he could use this not only for woodland, but also for pasturing. The next question. Well, this one begs for a little bit more time, I guess. How can I bring back a pasture that has been overgrazed? What should I plant? I have horses, <laughs> not cattle. And horses are pretty dead, by the way. We need to <laughs> the pasture. We probably need to correct the overgrazing first. What do you want to say, Katie? Go ahead, Katie. Oh, uh, yeah, definitely. You know, um, I would say, you know, giving it time time to rest and and if you can um you know separating the animals off of that to give it rest and I know with you know horses especially that can be difficult because they're um you know they're all they're there all the time so they're not necessarily going to be leaving the property like with cattle where you could um sell them so if you had a way to be able to to hold the horses in a smaller area and give the chance for a pasture to to regrow and regenerate and then um, look into some 
different seed mixes that are, you know, kind of especially for horses and especially for your area if you're trying to reestablish a perennial pasture. But definitely, you know, most importantly, giving it a chance to, to recover. And so while we're on this question, maybe you could add, how can I diversify what I plant? In the, I saw some of your pictures having lots of diversity in them. Well, yeah. Well, Ted told us um, he originally started out uh, with um, a combination of orchard grass and um, a novel fescue, uh, novel fescue. So that's an endophyte friendly fescue. Um, and, in, and he has since overseeded it with clover, uh, clovers. And then, as he said, other things that were uh, naturally on the farm uh, have come up from the seed bank over years. And so, uh, and this is uh, what we've heard from other farmers doing regenerative grazing uh, on their permanent, uh, their permanent pastures, their perennial pastures, is, is that uh, there's an amazing amount of uh, seed that's in the seed bed, uh, seed bank um, from decades and, and longer ago. Doug, I've also had people who plant chicory annuals like sorghum, mm -hmm. uh, sorghum sudan grass and... R right. Bridges, R yeah. Right, and and Jill alluded to that uh, when she talked about that they uh, bailed one of their summer summer uh, cover crops that it had a lot of diversity in it, and that that's a great way, particularly to bring diversity in for on an annual pasture. Uh, work with a good seedsman, and you can come up with amazing. Um, uh, seed mixes that can be used, whether it's going to be for spring, summer, or a, a fall seeding. Soil conservation question here by Cindy. Why would moving large housing or feed and water tractors by use of tractor not create soil compaction issues? Uh, the same way that cattle on the land won't cause compaction issues, because if you, if you take a look at a cow, we have 800 to 1,000 pounds on four, four tiny feet. And so there's a lot of compaction that can happen there, and this, which is, as Katie talked about, we need to have that sacrifice area. And it's the same thing with our chicken tractor or, or our portable water or feed system that we may have. Uh, if it's wet, we want it to be on the high ground, not in the low ground, because if you've left it in the low ground, you're going to cause... Yep, you're going to cause a lot of compaction, no matter what you use to get it out of there. Thank you. From Erin, if the goal is to have 50% of the plant material above ground, how do you achieve that with different livestock? Erin uh, says he's new to this, but cows, goats, chickens eat differently, which is true. Mm -hmm. Some of them down to the ground, some just at top. And how do you address that? So um, whenever we talk about, you know, moving them uh, and that's where your daily, your frequent moves come in is we want to prevent them from, um, I've heard it called, you know, taking the second bite. So when we're moving the animals across the pasture and they get trained and used to this system, as you can see in this picture, they will follow that temporary fence line and be ready to move in to the next section. So um, it's, it's all about, you know, them spending, if they're spending a lot of time um, on an area, they're going to, to work it over more. But if, if you're moving them more frequently, you know, they're only gonna have the chance to go over the plants um, one time and take what is most um, appealing to them before they come back and they start uh, working, working the plant over uh, further. And that's um, a lot with the same idea with chickens and uh, your smaller ruminants as well. And then allowing for that adequate rest um, is, is gonna help too. And Jill had an example with her chickens where she saw um, once they had done it a couple of days moving their chicken tractor, the animals would automatically move towards the end where there was gonna be new um, 
field exposed because they were ready to get um, the new bugs and the smaller broad leaves. And so um, once you train the animals, you know, they're going to, they're going to move through the pasture, the paddock that you've assigned them, and then they're going to be ready to go into the next one when you move that fence. Yeah. And if you have a pasture, if you're, if you've got lots of different animal species like cattle, goats or sheep and chickens, um, you may have to stage how the animals move through there. Because if it's tall growth, Jill mentioned to Katie and I, that they'll sometimes move the cattle through first because it's so tall. You don't want to lose chickens out there in the tall grass. Plus, the chickens have to be able to get in it close to the ground because they like to scratch and look for insects. And so you may have to stage your animals and move the, the larger ones through first and then move the second, the smaller ones through second, particularly the chickens, particularly the chickens. Thank you. Um, one of the videos, uh, Ted, was very difficult to hear. He was so soft and I yeah. didn't uh, from the microphone. So maybe you might want to do the slide and type in what he's saying, the salient points. Maybe. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yep, yep, yeah. yep. All right, from Canstrom, how long can I spread manure on a corn or bean field before the farmers begin to plant their crops? That's going to depend on the weather. <laughs> and it also depends on the crops because, oh yeah, it's corn and bean field. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If it's corn and beans, uh, you could you could uh, technically do it depending upon the operations that are going to be done ahead of planting uh, all the way up until uh, practically the day that they're going to come in and begin tillage and seeding or whatever they're going to do. Uh, but it's going to depend on, once again, on how wet the soil is. If it's wet, you don't want to be moving tractors and manure spreaders across wet fields because of all the compaction and rutting you're going to do. And also how long? Make sure you're not going beyond 20 tons per acre per year. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. yes, let's be good stewards. Right. There's another question. Woods grazing impact on lumber value for harvest at some point? Was the forest that consorted? This is once again, this is not continual grazing. You know, right, Katie? This, they're moved in, they're moved out, the, the, the animals aren't stripping barks off the tree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, they're not, you know, they're not staying there for extended periods of time or being allowed to um, hang out in that area whenever it gets, um, you know, in the heat of the day or anything. He may put them in there in the heat of the day um, when he moves them through, but he's not um, allowing them to go back to that place and stay there and, you know, really work the ground up or do damage to the trees. So that's a really good instance of where the animals are going to be led into that area and they're going to eat what is uh, most interesting to them first. So they're not going to mess with the trees in a, in a short amount of time, most likely. Right. Right. And especially, especially cattle, I would say maybe, maybe you would have more trouble with things like goats that are going to be more likely to climb and want uh you know some of the more branches and things like that but in the case of cattle i would say that that's true all right thank you is there a place to find recommended animal density go to a field day uh you, you go to field days this is where you really need to see it in practice to understand the effect that it can have and, and I would say both the, the pasture project or the land connection, those, they both have good um, links to videos and information as well to, to kind of explain some of those things in a little bit more detail, but there's nothing can, yeah, nothing can replace an in-person, you know, going to field days and seeing what it actually looks like and, and get out there and, and compare. And talk to the people that are doing it. So you two correct me, is it like on good pasture, one big animal like a cow per acre and five to six goats, goats or sheep per acre, generally? 
that that's the rule of thumb but but we don't want it to, we just don't, we don't want that the 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 one cow or the 10 cows on the 10 acres to be roaming that whole 10 acres we want that to be be divided up into lots into into paddocks and then those paddocks strip graze or grazed in grids as Katie talked about so that those animals are getting new fresh feed every day. Thank you. Okay, Zach already put an evaluation link in the chat box for those of you that haven't seen it yet. Um, and then Teacup farm, they came back with poison ivy is an organic dairy goat farm. And I don't know whether that was in reference to the first question. Uh, as far as spreading the seed in the wooded area that's tight, an ATV mounted spreader could work. Mm -hmm. Somebody put that there. Mm -hmm. Right. And then Pasta regeneration with frost seeding and allow to grow before grazing. I don't know that comment was in regard to what. Um, oh yeah, frost seeding, yes, yes. It's an excellent way particularly to get clovers into a permanent pasture. Could be done now with the snow, the ground, right? <laughs> well, hey, we like to have freezing and thawing, and we, we have that right now, depending where you are in the state. And uh, yeah, this uh, February is our month to do it. Once we get into March, our window is really closing fast uh, uh, from southern as we move into northern Illinois. We, we need the freeze-thaw cycle for that to work. And there's a comment here that for milk production, bovine goods, sheep, you need, to, you need to watch off flavor plants growing in pasture since these flavors show up in milk. Of course. All right, okay. All right. Um, right, woods pasture, I, I have had even flash grazing bovine size dust compact soil around tree roots impacting tree health. He, st he stated smaller goats and sheep did least damage compacting tree roots, flash grazing. If target is firewood, then this is not an issue. That's another comment. Well, and, and once again, it depends on how wet the soil is when we put those animals in there. We're always going to get compaction on, on wet soil. And unless there's something else, uh, we we'll I, I like to thank everyone. Uh, first of all, Doug and Kate for sharing your insights into the new concept regarding regenerative agriculture. We've learned a lot to a lot of home take home messages, and I hope we apply what we had so that we can use our natural resources more conservatively. Yes. And, and I would and, also, yeah, go ahead. And I was going to say, and Katie and I and others of us in Extension are hoping that we'll be having some grazing field days in the future. All right. Yes. And thank you all participants for joining us today. Hopefully this presentation has given you some new ideas you can put in place yet this winter and thereafter. And you have, if you have time right now, click the link in the chat box to complete a very short evaluation for today's session. We really do look at your feedback and use it to shape future webinars. Also look out for an email from us with a link to the archived webinar on the Illinois Local Foods YouTube channel. Illinois Local Foods YouTube channel and a link to a second chance to complete the evaluation of the webinar you've just watched. With that, enjoy the warm weather and and, and uh, see you next week. Bye bye.